Sunday, what would you still fuck. call while we're, while we're doing it? Jeff, you got the Giants game on? No, it's tomorrow. Wait, they played Monday night? Yeah, Giants is Monday night. Tonight's uh, Pittsburgh and uh, Kansas City. Oh, that's a shitty game. No, I mean, Pittsburgh should win, probably. Kansas City looks like shit, but who knows? I got fantasy on Kansas City, so let's go Travis Kelsey. Let's go Jeremy Macklin. (laughs) And with that said, welcome to a very long overdue episode of At The Bar Podcast. Finally. I'm a under the weather. Yeah, right? I'm a little under the weather. I have a sore throat, so if I sound kind of weird, apologies. But I'm your host, Mike, with me, long-distance relationship. We have Hollywood himself. What's up? And then, Jeff. It's been it's been a long time. Long it has. time coming. We've been we've been MIA for like a month. It's all my fault. But yeah, it's not well, it's not all your fault. I, I got a new job. You got a new job. That's right. Big changes. <laughs> Everyone gets a new job. Yeah. Uh so tell 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 the audience who's been yelling at me to get new new episodes out. Kind of tell them what we're debuting from this episode till forever. Okay, so debuting this episode, we have Mike's puberty voice. Yeah. If you can't hear it, he keeps... Uh, my voice is cracking. Yeah, it's it's going to be uh, for the remainder of this episode, so that's good. But permanently yeah. moving forward, we have a special guest that's coming onto the show tonight and will be joining us uh, permanently, as Mike said. So uh, we're pretty excited about it. We wanted to kind of expand the show and put a third personality on, and I think we found the right person, so... Uh, Mike, you want to go ahead and introduce him? Sure. His name, and we go by first name and basis, is here. Is Chris. How's it going, Chris, everybody? Hey, Chris. Hey. hey. So <laughs> we met. Uh, Chris is our new uh, third host. Uh, he's completing the triangle format, right? Yeah, our love we, triangle. We, yeah. <laughs> the Eiffel Tower format. <laughs> Dibs on um, the middle. Yeah. So we. Uh, me and Jeff posted a, uh, a, a kind of a status reaching out for, you know, looking for a third host to make finding a guest a lot easier now that Jeff is down south. And lo and behold, Mr. Chris answered the call and me and Jeff talked about it and absolutely agreed that he would be, you know, taking on that the third spot joining us. So everyone, welcome, Chris. Yeah. On the show. Thank you very much, man. I appreciate the, uh, the intro. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, we don't rehearse. We just kind of. Go on the fly. <laughs> no, I like that. I'm very by the seat of the pants. I'm a fan. You get used to it really fast. <laughs> Chris has well, like I'm cool with that. equipment too. Look, he has got like a real mic. I'm over here with a fucking gamer headset. Yeah, fancy, fucking right? <laughs> <laughs> Chris is like ready to go. He's legit. Yeah. So, Chris, kind of tell the audience the kind of about kind of what you do. You know that you're willing to you know give out um, uh, that and, and kind of how you got started in, in craft beer. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I kind of got into beer the same way a lot of people did by by drinking not so great versions of it for quite a while. Um, and then through traveling around when I was younger, kind of kind of landed up north doing some seasonal work and and found that where I was living, they took their their beer very very seriously, um, which was something I had never really seen living down in Orlando. So, um, so once I kind of moved back home, I actually joined up with the the world of beer as, as some of us here have done before. Um, not any of us. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, but yeah, man, I, I had a great time learning about it and just kind of decided that at that point I was at a, a crossroads and, and kind of saw that beer might be a thing I could make money doing and, and really enjoy doing. So, um, I've kind of since really taken the, the bull by the horns and try to do that. So it's been about eight or nine years since I've gotten in the industry. Oh, so you're not, you're now the oldest host of the show. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff is the youngest. So, yeah, that's me. So, um, kind of what, what, I know you, you mentioned about, you know, drinking kind of, you know, shittier beers or beers that don't kind of hold up to the quality of, of craft. Kind of what, I know we covered it in the past episodes uh, on kind of what beer or beers brought us into craft beer. So if you sure. want to kind of maybe... Maybe not as the first one, but like kind of the fir- your first couple beers that kind of like really hooked you in. So, so I remember four specifically. Like the first one was Amberbach, and and I tried that one, and I was like, this is different. It's it's not disgusting, and I kind of like drinking that more than anything else. 
Um, and then kind of Bass Paleo was the same way. Um, yes, that's a good one. <laughs> yeah, man. So I, I think I was like 17 when I tried that. And I was like, I'm not sure what's happening in my mouth, but I like it. Um, <laughs> so yeah, exactly. I've so said then, that to myself too many times. <laughs> and then probably about 20, 21 or so, I tried a Guinness for the first time, and it was the most disgusting thing I've ever had at the time. Um, but started realizing that there was a lot more out there than just the the run-of-the-mill plain stuff. Um, so from there, I think the fourth one that finally got me hooked was Stone Ruination. And I remember getting three sips into it and just not knowing why I bought it. And at the time, kind of pouring it out. But now, one of my favorite beers at the moment. So, isn't it wild? Kind of coming full circle. It's so wild how your taste buds yeah, change. Crazy. You can adapt. It's to weird things like dude. that. Like, oh, I've had so many beers where I'm like, man, I fucking hate this beer. And then, like, a year later, I'm like, this beer is so awesome. <laughs> you know? No, that that was like the epitome of that. Was I remember trying it and just like bitter face crazy. And then, uh, like to this day, if I find a four pack of it, I'll buy it. So. Awesome. So you're out of, uh, I mean, I, I know where you're out of, but for the, for the people who are just tuning in, you're out of like the Ocala Gainesville area, kind of sort of like north. I'm actually out of Orlando, my friend. Wait, so. wait. What? Yeah. You didn't know that? No, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Chris, was, uh, Chris was instrumental in helping us set up the, um, the uh, homebrew competition oh, we did, World of Best, or, uh, World of uh, Beer. The best one. And Far also, from it, man. And also one of the uh, one of the winners of that, yeah. if, I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Which place? What place did you come in? You got I got third. third. Yeah, man. Third place. It was a good, really good beer. Thank you very much, man. I appreciate. Should, it. Should Been working on that one second. for a while. Should have gotten second, but we won't get into that. <laughs> I will keep my opinion to myself. <laughs> but uh, so, yeah, it was, it was an awesome event, and I'm glad you could help us out. And it was a huge no, you success. you guys did a great job with that. I mean, like that was the first time I've ever seen anyone kind of really take that initiative to showcase the homebrew scene in the Orlando area. So that was really cool. Yeah, Jeff, good job. <laughs> yeah, well, it's in the past. All right. We'll do another one in Black Marlin. <laughs> <laughs> so so we're we're a beer podcast and like any typical any other beer podcast, we're all drinking beers, me being the last one to uh cave in. So we're going yeah, around the table favorite, starting yeah. with Jeff. Jeff, what you drinking? I am drinking in honor of the new digs here down in South Florida. I'm drinking a Ballast Point Black Marlin since the new sponsor of the show is, in fact, the Black Marlin down in Stewart. So I'm drinking oh, nice. a Ballast Point Black Marlin. We actually just uh, settled the deal with Ballast Point to have that beer kegged for us specifically. Dude, that's and awesome. And we have that on tap at all times. So we now have a permanent line of Black Marlin at Black Marlin. So exciting oh, things. Exciting that's really things cool. happening. <laughs> And it's Chris, good in drinking? case you haven't had it. I've got the uh, Lagunitas Sucks. And then the backup is the Swamp Head Wild Night, just in case this goes a little long. So <laughs> We have been known to go a little long. <laughs> Hence, I came prepared, my friend. He's outshining us to get backups. <laughs> yeah. I have a bomber. So, you know. <laughs> oh, shit. I got Okay. He's got the efficiency route. <clears throat> yeah, right. I am drinking uh, the Dogfish Head Sequench Ale Session Sour. Yeah, That's tell me about good. that one, man. Yeah, I haven't had yeah, it yet. So, oh, wait, wait. Is that the orange one? No, this is the um, it's the lime peel, black lime, and sea salt. Yeah, like a, okay, I have had that one. I, I lied to you, you on the. Uh, I had it. It's good. Yeah, it's that one. Yes, yeah, it's, it's like it's the really uh, awesome. the goza style that they did, or yeah, it's um, okay. if, to me it tastes like a goza. I'm not sure if they label it as a goza, but it's I thought it was the American Wild. I don't know. See, see how we're prepared we are. Um, it's well, maybe a, a collaboration with the National Aquarium. I don't see a style on here. It just says a session sour, but it does taste like a uh, <clears throat> excuse me a goes. So it's really lime. So it's really tart. Uh, the bitterness is not bad. It's actually really, it's actually really crushable. Um, I don't know what black limes taste like, but I don't know if I'd want to find it. I highly recommend it. Highly recommend yeah. it if I would give it an untapped score, 4.25. Nice, man. At the bar score, half. I'm really digging it. And it's Dr. Shed, so everything from there is, is super quality. So, so yeah, moving they don't forward. Miss very much. Yeah, we're, we're a little rusty. I don't know what to, normally it's a drunk transition to something else, and, nor, and we're 
Challenge accepted. Football. Are you watching football right now? Don't be watching what? football and getting distracted. I'm 100% focusing on, on this shit show right here. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, what styles kind of did you start off liking? And then how did you transition into the styles that you're drinking now? Sure, man. I, um, I started getting into the kind of the hoppier stuff at first. Um, IPAs, obviously, everyone jumps into those right away. Not everyone, but a lot of people do. Not us, too. No. <laughs> no? All right. No, no. And that, that, was, <laughs> that was one thing I found, too, is like everyone kind of either picks like super malt or super hops right away. Um, so I picked the super hop route and then kind of found myself getting into Belgians. Um, and then nowadays, you know, pretty much just whatever I feel like during the day. Love red IPAs. Um, I love Berliner Weisses. Um, Belgians are great. Um, just kind of depends on the day, really, man. So, how about you guys? We finally have a hop head I mean, on the I'm show. The same way, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, as someone who likes Belgians. <laughs> Belgians and hops. We're so well rounded now. That's yeah. the only reason I'm here, just to fill the void. <laughs> the trifecta. <laughs> no, believe me, there's been so many times we've been trying beers, and we're like, we're like, well, neither of us like IPAs that much, and we really don't like <laughs> Belgians that much. <laughs> we're like, we're like the worst hosts ever. Our score's a little jaded, but whatever. <laughs> that almost sounds like it was written. Perfect. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm, I'm very situational, like pretty 100. percent So if it's if it's hot out, I'll go for a sour. I'll go for a wheat beer. Um, if it's little colder out or if i feel like getting really drunk i go darker uh imperials you know heavier stouts uh porter stuff like that but um i've always had a weird and jeff knows rather well um how weird my palate gets okay Mm -hmm. so you know i'll order a cider which i'm not ashamed of drinking and then i'll drink the the cider you know slam it and then i'll get marshall zukov and then and then slam that down so it's i like your style good sir yeah, the, the really the only styles that I never liked and I still don't like are pale ales and IPAs. Even though I've been making more of a conscious effort to drink more IPAs, and I've been called That's out. Right, on at least it. you tried it. Out. Yeah. And yeah, so I went to Bowiegans Friday for their bottle release, <clears throat> and Bobby was there, handsome Bobby. And then I ordered. He's like, "What are you getting?" So I ordered whatever first beer, and then uh, the second beer I got their trop 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 tropical IPA, or okay. T- or whatever they call it so it's pretty much their their version of a florida ipa so it's a lot of citrus a lot of wow that's your, like that. that's got to be your least favorite beer ever yeah, it, was. <laughs> it was it was yeah he looked at me he's like i thought you didn't like ipas i'm like i still don't but or citrus like you're ordering this on purpose things. yeah i wanted i want to try because everyone's like oh you gotta go to bowiegans and get their tropical you know beer and i actually liked it uh that's awesome. I liked it just as much as a, a Bell's Too Hearted. So uh, IPAs are still kind of iffy with me. Uh, double IPAs are still good. Pale ales are kind of 50-50, but, uh, you know, it's, it's a little bit of everything. Did you like Carl? Did you like Carl at Red Cypress? The Carl? Um, if it was a little bit colder, I think I would have liked it a little bit more. Yeah, because um, that's like a super citrusy Florida-style IPA, too. Or, well, it's like a citrusy New England style, it's, or what they call yeah, it. It's a New England uh, citrus but bomb. it's citrusy, yeah. By the time I thought it was, it, it was kind of warm, but um, it, it's, it was, I mean, above average. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I would give it like a B, B or B minus. But I wasn't, I wasn't crazy about it, like uh, Death Roll. Yeah, Death Roll's still my favorite beer by that. You do a great job on that, man. Um, <laughs> I... Uh, I, you'd be happy to know, Mike, that in my absence of Orlando, I've pretty much expanded to enjoy enjoying every style of beer. So I don't I don't have any gaps in my palate anymore, man. So you're including Berliner Weisses, including Berliner Weisses. What? Stinky cheese Berliners. I love my cheesy Berliners now. You're, you're a new man. I I've think I never do attribute to that. Well, you maybe. <laughs> Except she drinks too much. She drinks too much fucking wine. That's true too. Hmm. Yeah. It's all You're wine right. for her, man. Yeah, she's fancy. <laughs> That's yeah, she's fancy. So, That's so it, what? Yeah. What? Jeff, what? Berliners and Belgians. What? To, what beers have you had of those that kind of like put you over the hump there? Oh God, I don't even know, man. I have. Uh, I've been going to this bottle shop down in Jupiter. It's called Craft Beer City, and I'm literally just asking the guy, like, what's your favorite? You know, what's your favorite new beer that you got in or whatever, whatever this is. And I'm I'm grabbing up whatever he has. There was this one from Washington. Um, 
I can't remember the name of the brewery, but they had all bottle conditioned beers, which is, you know, hit or miss. You're probably going to hate half of them and like half of them. But I got an Imperial yeah. Stout. I got a sour from them. Uh, They're pretty good. There's something family, something family brewing. Um, or no, it was urban, urban something, urban city, urban some. I don't know. But a couple things like uh, things like that. I've been just going down to the bottle shops down there and just grabbing whatever they have available. Um, I probably shouldn't have dropped, name dropped them. So if you could just take that out of the show, that'd be great. Because I don't want people to know that that place exists. So <laughs> <laughs> you could just take thing. Craft Beer City out and plug in. <laughs> if he uh, says it again. <laughs> it's the local Circle K. That's where he's been. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's actually circle. just called 7-Eleven in Juba. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. But yeah, I mean, I th- I've been drinking the sours, man. Yeah, yeah. I've got uh, what's the blueberry one? Um, God, that blueberry. Muddy Nose actually just came out with one, I believe. Where it was like the a blueberry, blueberry sour. Yeah, maybe that's the one. But yeah, I've been drinking some blueberry blenders and some different kinds of fruity blender vices and stuff. And um, as long as it's not raspberry, it honestly, I'm okay. Raspberry blender vices are just super cheesy. <laughs> but Otherwise, like they taste like funny. Cheez-Its. You talking like taste they wise? Yeah, I think they taste yeah. like Cheez-Its. I, I found that it's like really brewery specific, man, as far as how they actually do their souring process. Because if it's done incorrectly, you can get some of that like cheesy, footy, funk kind of thing going on. Dude, you're the only one who's ever said that it tastes like cheese besides me. No, yeah, no, it, it's a total byproduct under the, the wrong circumstances for lack of bacillus. Oh, yes. yes. Absolutely. Uh, if you want to get super yeah, no nerdy, it's actually... You're crazy, Jeff. <laughs> No, if you want to get super nerdy, it's like ever, isovaleric yeah, acid. Nobody ever said that they, they tasted cheese. They say they taste funk, but like... No, it's like I straight up Parmesan. Cheese. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's that beer's infected, right. <laughs> oh, every that's single one of them I ever fun. drink them. So, yeah, well... Well, so. and I think, well, we're not good. We can talk about that when we get into the actual topic after the break, sure. but that's going to be kind of... That's. I think that that's what you get when a lot of breweries are putting out beers just to put them out and they're not doing them correctly yeah that's, especially, that's a good that's a good yeah, segue. especially with sours and stuff like that man it's there's not a lot of research going on for it so a lot of it's trial by fire you know yeah yeah they're like getting their oh let's get these yeasts over here and let's try and make it happen and, or the ever popular you know. let's just dump it in it'll totally work right let's not take into account any of the other variables so right <laughs> not naming any names <laughs> But with that said, guys, we're going to take a quick break and then continue with, I'm assuming it's going to be a lot longer part two of. Yeah, I got to get another beer anyway. I'm going to upgrade my ABV game. Cool. And we'll be right back. So this is part two of uh, whatever the fuck I'm going to name this episode. Uh, Probably some with Chris being a new host or something like that. Anyway, so I was on a date with this with this girl a couple months ago, and this is kind of what inspired this topic so i was out to this new brewery in orlando won't name names until after the show um but we were there and they only had a couple beers on tap and granted they're open so we went there and everything i had was very 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 disappointing and subpar so we're sitting there drinking beer and i did the dick move of i got to a point where i was like you know what (laughs) i started ordering bottles out of the cooler from like Terrapin and Lagunitas. And so I I pulled a dick move, which is something I'm totally against. But question for this topic is with so many breweries having subpar mediocre beer, are they, excuse me, are they watering down the quality and image of craft beer? So that's the topic. Jeff, you want to take that one first? Yeah, absolutely. I I always get fired up about these kind of topics. So, you know, I want to go for it. Um, I think it's uh, it's one of those things. So there's so we what do we? I don't even know the statistics because of course I'm underprepared. But I know as of last year there was forty forty five hundred new breweries. I think it's pretty, think it's pretty accurate. It's, it's somewhere around there now. And yeah, it's somewhere in the mid four thousands of all these breweries. And at the same, I, I've said I don't know if I've said this on the show before, but at the same point where I say, you know, there's all these new breweries which breeds innovation and can make some really awesome beer, because if forty five hundred breweries are doing new stuff and even 10% of it is good, then you're looking at 450 cool new styles or cool new beers that come out that are absolutely unique and different. So 
I, that in that respect, having all these breweries and having all this beer come into the market can breed some really cool innovations. On the flip side of that argument, everybody thinks they need every style of beer. And it's annoying because there's one, there's no way to get any kind of distribution. You can't. You're competing in the most, you're competing for, for a spot in a stock pond. Like everything is, there's, there's a thousand to other people doing the exact same thing as you. So everybody who says, I need to have an IPA, but not only that, I need to have an IPA, an East Coast IPA, a West Coast IPA, a New England IPA, a double IPA. And then all of a sudden you have breweries that don't even specialize in IPAs that have seven IPAs. And I think that the fact that we do that, as consumers, we require it. We ask them to do it. But I think at some point it's a brewery's responsibility to say, I specialize in this. This is what I do well. And if everybody specialized in what they specialized in, it would take away a lot of the shit beer out of the market and we'd be able to actually drink quality beer more often. You know, yeah. um, my brother does liquor distribution and he asked me a while ago when I was at world of beer, he was like, so how do you get a permanent tap at world of beer? And I was like, honestly, you, you don't like, you just don't get permanent distribution because why would I, when there's going to be another 15 IPAs that come out in the, in the next week, you know what I mean? So we're going to constantly yeah. filter out all of this stuff and 55, 60% of it sucks. But yeah, I mean, that's the market yeah, we live in. It's, it's, it's a battle. And, and I know when I pitched the idea to you two, Chris made a good point of, you know, you can take this at so many different angles and <clears throat> you can say, you know, it, not everything can be perfect. And that the fact that we come across super snobby by saying this brewery has nothing, we compare it to so many of the bigger beers that it clouds our judgment to, well, it may not be a heady topper, it may not be, you know, a Huna or, or anything, but it's still a good beer. Right. So, yeah. You know, it's the battle between these breweries that are just popping up should already have an idea of what sells, what people look for, the trademark. You should have an idea of, of what styles or what ingredients that are people are searching for. And then even if it's an exact duplicate, you know, the same ingredients, I mean, so if it has fucking coconut cocoa nibs, that's not a, co you know, a copyrighted ingredient. Fucking make your own and make it your own and make it better and, and own, own it and, and not try to be too different and then it backfire. For example, when we went to Lauderdale in Fort Lauderdale, we had their coconut porter, their sea porter, which is not an original idea at all. It's cocoa nibs and fucking coconut in a porter. Everyone, everyone fucking does it, right? But it tasted so freaking good that it's probably the best one that I've had. Minus last no. Last yeah, last no. Yeah, yeah, last is kind of a juggernaut, man. That's, that's a right. pretty good one. Yeah. But in terms of a small brewery like that, doing their own thing, you know, falling into the hype, which I know we make fun of, but they executed it, you know, fucking perfectly. But there's other breweries like the one I went to that tried to be too creatively different and it didn't, it didn't work out, whether it's their new system, which they should already know how to do their new system before they even open. Um, or it, I don't know. It, like, that's the thing is, is you know, your first impression is your biggest. And if your beers are lackluster, either A, don't put it out or condition it or fucking do something. I just, I, I feel like there's a lot of opinions that can be had within this conversation because you can break it down between either the brewery or the consumer. So sure. with the brewery, I'm like hoping. if you're opening up and, and your brewery is opening up with like a seasoned veteran as a brewer, you know, a great, you know, business major as in, in, in that apartment and like all of a sudden everything works perfectly. Everyone's melting together. They're making the best product possible and they're pushing it out. Or a lot of times now, especially with the information source that we have, a lot of people are learning how to make beer. They may not be able to make it well, but, you know, they make it well enough that all their friends like it. And all of a sudden they're, they're opening a brewery and, and trying to, you know, pour some faucets out. And their friends still may say it's pretty good. But when it comes to people like ourselves who go in, we might try it. It may not be the greatest thing that we've ever had. Right? Right. Right. So then you also look at the consumer, too, to where, you know, five to ten years ago, the consumer going to a local brewery, it wasn't necessarily how good the beer was. It was, wow, they make it here on site. And that's the coolest part of it. 
So nowadays, I feel like we have a lot more of an educated consumer to where they've almost become kind of policing in the sense to where they'll actually start not going to the ones that aren't as good um, to where <laughs> five to 10 years ago, you would run into a, hey, it's a local brewery. It opened up, you know, beer's not that great, but, you know, we're still going to go over there Friday night and have a couple of pints. Now it's one of those, yeah, their beer's not that great. We're going to go check out the ones we know we can rely on, or we'll go to the bar down the street that actually has good beer that we know. You know what I mean? And Well, so, so in that respect, do you think that that is kind of the, the market being watered down has created a consumer that's, that's a little bit more um, – not maybe educated or I don't like using more aware, but more aware, yeah. but more, I would say it's actually, they, re they require a better product because of I, how much yeah. beer is in the market that I don't necessarily think it's watered down. I, I think for a while there, there, there wasn't enough uh, product to supply for the demand. Um, so now that there is, We've got consumers now who are trying the beers, who are learning about them, who are learning what an amber ale is, who are learning what a Belgian double is and all these different kind of things. And not only learning about them, but kind of expecting a certain um, quality of product, if you will. So, so now, whenever they go out, it's not just good enough to have one of those styles on. It's You have to actually have that style on and be able to make it well as well, if not better than either the commercial breweries or the, or the local breweries around you. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you this. So this is kind of where I was kind of going with it because I agree with you. There, there's a lot of styles that are underproduced still. So it's not a watered down market. I don't see Imperial Reds ever. And that's a great style of beer, but it's not. Any beer. Agree. And, and you don't really, I mean, Imperial Stouts are, are awesome, but you see a ton of them. Double IPAs are awesome, but you see a ton of them. In some respects, I think they're at the exact level where they need to be. Those two styles. But I think your regular and session, if you group them together, IPAs, I think are massively overproduced, like absurdly overproduced. And pale ales, so overproduced. Well, it's kind of like a catch-22, though. A million of them. Yeah, like the know? consumer almost expects you, like as somebody who walks into a, a tap room or something, you almost expect to see an IPA. You expect to see a pale ale. If you don't, you almost give them shit for not having it. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. So, so it's one of those... We, we demand it, but we also kind of... But we demand you to do it well. We demand you to do it well. <laughs> and then by everyone having to do it, then yeah, we're, we're going to get some, some muddy water in the mix. It is right. what it is. So, Yeah. I mean, it's... it's, it's, it's man, I don't know. It, it's like, you know, you go to a brewery and there's four different IPAs and each one's like mediocre or bad or whatever. But yet and it's that, like, but the battle that they have is that, well, I can make a shitty IPA and it's still going to sell because... I only offer one or two. And if you're coming to my brewery and you like hop, you're automatically going to buy it anyway, anyway, whether it's good or bad. Well, that's one point I wanted to make too is, is I, I think a lot of times we forget like us talking, we're, we're literally going out of our way to talk about beer, you know, just because we like doing it. Right. right. So for every one of us, there's 10 people walking into a craft beer bar, maybe knowing a little bit about an IPA, maybe knowing, like knowing a little bit about an, like an Amber Ale. And then for every, one of those, there's 10 more just seeing Dog Fishette on the shelf or just seeing Magic Hat on the shelf. And for every one of those, there's 10 other ones still drinking Miller Lite. So it's, it's still trickling down. Like as much as, as we think that it's out there, it's not really touching as many people as we think it is. Does that make sense? Yeah, I get you. Yeah, we're in the bottleneck. Upper, right. Oh, for yeah. sure. We're in the bottleneck. Um, yeah, yeah, for sure. But what, uh, so I just wanted to say, I know I'm completely breaking the entire. Uh, segment here, but I just cracked open a 2015 Wake and Bake, and I have to shout out Terrapin right now because nice. that shit is so good. Like it's so fucking good. This shit's it's, awesome. It, it's so good. I don't get. And it's, it's kind of hard to go like, wrong with that, man. It's oh, like shout out to out. It like mellowed out so much. It's like awesome. This Let's is shout brought out to you by Terrapin. Since you just opened up the swap, shout out Terrapin. <laughs> Well, fuck out um, invoice them now. <laughs> no, so, so yeah, I, I don't necessarily know that watered down is the right word for per se, and I kind of agree with you. It's a consumer built issue because I think it's a problem. I, I do think it's a problem. I'm not going to sit here and say I don't think it's a problem, and I think it's a problem in in two respects. I think one, we're in the bottleneck. I think we're in that. I don't want to call us the top one percent because we're definitely not like. I, I at least I don't consider myself an, an enthusiast. I love beer, but I'm not like 
traveling the world to get certain beers. Like I, if I come across it, I get it and I drink it and I like it. So I think I'm a, I, I think I'm very into craft beer, but I'm not an enthusiast, but even so, um, I think that for the top people that are very into it. And then for the bottom people who are trying to get into it, I think it's a problem that everybody has so many styles that they don't do well because if I went to a brewery and did not know about beer, and like you said, you want to try an amber ale and get introduced to that style, you don't want to try one that's stylistically imperfect and then think that's what amber ales are supposed to taste like. And then, because I've had amber ales that are hoppier than a double IPA, and, and they are they burn the back of your throat because they're so bitter and they're dry and they have that just like, you know, that, that funky, like, dry out your mouth. And I'm like, right. that's not an amber ale. That's not. I mean, an amber ale is it has a hop profile, but not. It's not a 90 IBU amber ale. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, to me, I I think it's important that if you are gonna do the style and it's not what you specialize in, do it to style at at the minimum. I don't care if you want to do anything else with it, but at least when you try that beer, you need to say this is a good representation of what this style is supposed to be, because I think you have an obligation as a brewery to put out a beer that if I didn't know what I was drinking, I should be able to say that's what this style of beer tastes like. So more more so like not only upholding your brand, but also upholding whatever it is that like that defines the craft beer scene around you. Exactly. Yeah, you're defining an industry. You're you're labeling yourself as a craft brewery, so you make craft beer. So you're a, rep a representative of a bigger a bigger entity. I don't know, man. I'm I'm still kind of I'm I'm sticking to the idea that like now that the consumers have, have over the last like decade or so kind of really gotten into what this craft beer scene is. Um, I, I think they're finally getting to a point to where, you know, they're, they're really starting to police the scene. You know what I mean? Like they'll speak out if it's not good. They'll, they'll leave the reviews if it's not good. And they will literally tell everyone and their mom if, if one of the beers is the best thing they've ever had. I mean, a lot of a lot of right. brands like have actually grown themselves on the back of that. Like you can look at Funky Buddha where, you know, with maple bacon and coffee porter, you know, they, they, got to where they are because of that beer and because of how well it was received by a bunch of beer fans just literally geeking the hell out about it. But I mean, you know, a lot of breweries, oh, that's wait. how they, they came up is that one beer. I just shot them up into, you know, quote unquote, stardom. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Everyone's got that one for sure. Um, and then you look at a lot of the other local breweries around here too, where, you know, I'm sure we all know some that we won't name any names, but we all know some where they just don't have the greatest reputation. And it's not because, you know, everyone has this one beer aficionado friend that walks in and just like, nope, it's awful. But it's not only you get that from them, but you also get it from all your other friends too, who just aren't big beer fans, but they might go try it out just cause, and it, they still give you that same review. You know what I mean? Yeah. Right. So. Well, Chris, you're a home brewer, and Mike, I know you've home brewed, and Preston is huge on this whenever I talk to Preston about his home brews, is getting honest feedback from your friends when you do when you Am I am I getting is he getting cut off? <laughs> yeah, I think so. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't going fucking Jeff. God damn. Hold on, Jeff. Try that again. Try that again. <laughs> am I back? Did you yeah, you, back, sir. Like, it, it, yeah, you got muted or whatever. I got muted. Why'd you guys mute me? Yeah, just because. No, like, it just plot twist. All right, I'm gonna start over again. Then, where did I right. start at? Uh, so homebrewing, home yeah, yeah, homebrewing. So, so, so yeah, so I know homebrewers for the most part they want honest opinions back, and and so many people are opening up breweries on the on the backbone that they were told um, by so many of their friends, like, man, your beer's really good. Your beer's really good. Like, you should open up a brewery, and like. Some friends, maybe they're honest, maybe they're right, but some friends maybe don't know that much about craft beer, and this is the best Absolutely. thing we've had since Bud Light. And yeah. then you're saying, open a brewery because you make a better beer than Bud Light. Well, like, I, I don't know. I, I've never brewed before in my life, and I think that if I took one brewing class and hung out with Mike and, and Chris for a day, that we could probably put our heads together and brew a beer better than Bud Light. That doesn't mean that we need to open a brewery. You know I, what I mean? I, yeah, so yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I, I get with that. Yeah. I think there has to be an obligation for somebody like Ryan Parker, who was a home brewer, who said, yeah, I know how to brew beer, but I want to hire a head brewer who actually knows how to brew beer when I open mm -hmm. Red Cypress. Yeah. Because I think there's an obligation for you to say, yeah, I might be, I'll be involved in the brewing. I'll throw my ideas in, but I'm not, I'm not the head brewer because I just am, I'm a home brewer. And you know, there's got to well, be some kind of model. 
there's there's one thing I'll say about that too is with with the homebrewing aspect, a lot of great breweries were started on the backs of of homebrewers. You know what I mean? Yeah. So in, with homebrewing too, it's it's so subjective. You know, you could you it's I've equated it to this where you can take a recipe and it can be as simple as an easy bake oven recipe, or it can be as complicated as baking a croissant from scratch. Right. It just depends on how much of a level you want to get in depth with it. So it really depends on who they're hiring to do that brewing process, how how much they actually care about the process, and and what product they're trying to create. If it's just a turnkey kind of recipe, or is it something they're really taking the initiative to, you know, to turn out the best you know quality product possible? So, well, well, like, so I went out. So just use that that Wild Homebrew Festival as an example. We went out there. You guys, I mean, you guys tried everybody's beers, right? Pretty much. I don't know, Chris, Mostly, if you went yeah. around and tried uh, everybody. I did, yeah. So there was a lot of good beer out there. There's a ton of great beer. Um, out of that group of, of everybody out there, I would say there's maybe three or four people that, that could open a brewery and that I think their beer is good enough to be opening a brewery out of the, out of the 20 people that we had. 20 yeah, plus people that we have. Yeah, yeah, so would, like, yeah. so, but I guarantee all of them, I know I counted their votes. All of them had a significant number of votes of friends of theirs who said, you're good enough to open a brewery. You should do this professionally. So like if you <laughs> brainwash somebody into doing that and then you only, I mean, that that's less than 20%. That's less than 20% of the people that were there could open a brewery successfully in, in our opinion, as far as quality of beer. And I mean, granted, I might be wrong. I might have a complete, you know, I might be off completely on what the market is. But to me, there's four people good enough to brew beer professionally, and I bet you all of them have plans to. Yeah. So yeah. that's that's <clears throat> where the market that's where the market gets watered down. I would say the biggest problem with that is these people asking their, their friends and family. And their friends and family kind of like fangirl over it. Like, oh my God, can you believe my friend is going to open a brewery and these beers are so good and I get to tell everybody that I'm extra cool because I know the owner, I know the head brewer. And and like, they can give them water and they say, this is the best water I've ever had in my entire life. It Just really because is, yeah. they, their friend or their brother or whoever is opening a cool business compared to like, oh, a library, I don't care, whatever. but he's opening a brewery, I'm bring all friends over, like, get drunk, we get fucked yeah. up, uh, you know, I think that's the initial problem of, you know, there's these competitions that you can get your beers judged at, so, you know, BJCP, there's, you know, Sunshine Challenge, there's a bunch of them um, anywhere, enter your beers in, and see what an unbiased opinion is of the, of that style, of that you know, beer and whatever. And then if you got a bad score and then either a not brew it or change the recipe, or if you get, you know, a 40 out of 50, or whatever the score is, maybe that's something you keep and have that in your arsenal to when you do want to open a brewery, you have an unbiased opinion of someone who knows beer, not just a friend who's going to say anything just because he wants you to open a brewery to drink free beer. Dude, I can't right. champion that whole aspect enough, man. Like anybody who's out there, if you're listening to this, considering opening a brewery and you've got recipes that you think are great, put them in Bring competition. Bring them on the show. <laughs> Bring them on the show, yeah. yeah, yeah. And competition. Preferably bombers, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, I mean, yeah. dude, we'll be honest with you. You send us a bottle onto the show. We'll be honest with you. Absolutely. Yeah, you, it's, it's, send it to three you need, you need <laughs> yeah. unbiased feedback for sure. Yeah, and, I mean, and, and those those I mean those competitions get your name out there too because you're not the only one you know entering a beer. There's 30, 40 other people, so it's it's, it's an opportunity to network to get different ideas and go to festivals that you know, like the Wab Homebrew Fest, you know, and meet people in the same predicament as you are. Either they're about to open and they're you know about to open their doors getting the paperwork in or they just homebrew and and those are the opinions that you should take into consideration more than a friend or a family member who's just going to feed you shit just because they don't want to be mean or anything like that oh and they're also getting free beer so that kind of sways and they're getting free beer, right yeah and that's i think that's something to consider too you know and and like chris why i mean on the show i kind of want to know your opinion on this sure. we me jeff labeled orlando as the butthole of Florida craft beer, which I still stand by today. Okay. <laughs> but would you agree or disagree? And then two, why do you think Orlando is so far behind or why do you think the other cities are so ahead of us? So 
two parts on that. Um, one, as far as like a, a consumer drinker kind of aspect goes, um, Orlando's always been a really weird market, man. It's, it's been one of those kind of things where even if you were really, really into craft beer, it's not like you had a lot around you. You know what I mean? You right. had one or two. You had one or two breweries around you, and you, you, or you looked to like Tampa or Jacksonville or maybe Miami for a couple other local breweries, uh, maybe Gainesville, something like that. Um, but you're really learning your palate over the last five, maybe ten years um, through the best of the national brands, through what you can get at ABC's, Total Wines, World of Beers, things like that, right? Mm -hmm. So that's your benchmark. So now, whenever something opens up around you, it's not as good as bells if it's not as good as dogfish head if it's not as good as some of these national brands that you've been drinking for years then all of a sudden you're like nah it's you know they're all right but they're not really doing what they're doing um secondly i think with orlando i was having a conversation with a friend of mine he actually he lives up in gainesville and uh he wrote me an email he was asking about some of the local breweries to check out so i think a lot of people in orlando have this this preloaded uh, answer to the conversation of, you know, what brewery should I check out? And the answer is, yeah, we don't really have that many. But if you look at it now, we actually had three or four open up over the last six months. We right? have a lot of breweries, actually. Yeah. yeah. Just, so how I was going, quality are they is the question. But that's the thing is I was going through and I'm writing on the, uh, the list of, of breweries that are around us. And, you know, we have like Cask and Larder. We have, you know, Dead Lizard. We have Broken Strings, Black Cauldron, all these things that have opened up around us where, you know they're they're opening up and 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 they're they're putting out pretty good product for their first days. You know what I mean? Right. Oh yeah. Yeah. So like and and there's only room to grow. You know if they were if you know four or five months in they're still like not still but if, first day they're making something terrible and four or five months in they're making something terrible then obviously we would kind of talk about that too. But they're all making pretty solid stuff. So and they're only going to get better. So I think Orlando's kind of I think we've got this preconceived notion that Orlando just doesn't have the scene going on. But I think that's because we just didn't have it for so long. We're just, just almost hardwired to give that answer. Right. When nowadays we're actually, I think we're really turning the point to where we've got a lot of them open up. Um, I've done my best to try to go out to a lot of the new ones and try out what they're doing. And they're actually, I mean, for, for opening day, maybe first opening months, they're doing a really good job with the quality of their product. You know what I mean? I think, uh, yeah, I think I kind of, as soon as Mike asked you the question, and maybe it's just the way he worded it, it made it different for me this time. Um, but it's, uh, I, I still agree, don't get me wrong. I think, but I think you have to split it again into two different things, consumer and brewery. So as far as craft beer consumers go, I, do, I actually don't think Orlando is the butthole of craft beer anymore. Because I think that there's a lot of craft beer culture in Orlando now. There's Absolutely. a lot of places you can go. You can go to a handful. There's probably 25 breweries in the greater Orlando area now that are actually all within 25 minutes of downtown Orlando, which is, in my opinion, easily drivable. Not just drivable, but easily drivable. Um, and then I think that uh, besides that, you have you know you have places like um, uh, Frankenstein's and Public House and all the world of beers in the Orlando area. There's six of them, you know all the uh, brass taps in the Orlando area, all the red light, red lights, all the different craft beer bars in that area that craft beer, if you want a craft beer, you don't got to go far. Oblivion right there on, on, uh, on wow. uh, colonial, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you, if you're at home and you put, if you type beer in, or craft beer or whatever into your phone and it doesn't come up in less than three miles, I'd be really surprised. You know, Absolutely, I think everybody yeah. lives very close to some kind of craft beer spot in Orlando. So in that respect, as a consumer, I don't actually think it's like a butthole of craft beer anymore. I think the quality of beer coming out of Orlando is a different story. Because if I'm going to judge it off of distribution, there's not a lot of good distribution in Orlando. See, there's that's not a, a lot whole of distribution. Facet, though. Like, there's that's, not a that's... lot of distribution at all in Orlando. No, and, and that's 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 you and I both know that's, that's a whole different monster. You know oh, what I mean? Of course. Yeah, it is. So. And that's, you know, that's because we're a young craft beer market, but then there's also, there are people in Orlando who are in distribution who absolutely should not be. And then, <laughs> and then there's, there's other places that should be that very well could do great in distribution out of Orlando that aren't, that aren't because they're kind of, I think smarter and they're waiting until they can be self-sustaining in their tap room and then finance their, their distribution through their tap. Absolutely, room. man. Um, but 
I, I, you know, I think it's getting better. Don't get me wrong. Like I think craft beer, the, the culture and the awareness of what's going on in Orlando is, is vastly improving. I, I would agree with that. Yeah. It's definitely improving I just, fast. I just think that there's, there is a lot of breweries doing subpar stuff in Orlando, like more so than anywhere else that I've gone where like, the, I, I think like your bottom feeder breweries in Tampa put out better beer than most breweries in Orlando. See, I don't know, man. Like I, I, I almost have to disagree with you on that because I, I've been trying out, you know, some of the ones that have been opened up for the last few months and, and maybe it's because I'm, I'm so used to going into a new brewery, um, you know, throughout my, my existence in this, uh, this industry, um, and, and trying it out and almost expecting to be mediocre, but expecting them to build upon it. You know what I mean? And eventually it, getting to a good point. Now, I, a lot of the breweries around here, I, I think you're putting out pretty good versions of certain products. You know what I mean? To where, like, if that's the benchmark, then that's pretty solid after the first month or two of being open. Right. You know what I mean? So, um, now granted, there are some that are, yeah, like there, there are some that could use some tweaking on certain recipes and, and we can sit there and say that, you know, maybe their IPA is great, but their cream ale needs some work or whatever it may be. But at the end of the day, like they're, they're doing fairly well for just opening the doors, just putting product out and having a good time doing it. Um, as opposed to that almost lag period that we're almost used to having being a beer fan where you go to a new brewery and if it's great, that's awesome. But also if it's not, you're like, eh, well, you know, they're just opening up. We'll kind of give them a pass and we'll see how it is in four months. You know what I mean? Sure. And to piggyback yeah. what both what both of you said, I think from what the beers I've had, the Florida IPA is is a new thing. I think every brewery that I've so been what to, is that? I'm sorry, I, I'm 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 new to that one. It's essentially a New England, uh, a takeoff New England, it's but it's it's, it's, a, it's like a citrus bomb. So it's it's super okay. tropical, very it's citrusy. A Florida IPA, but it's, it was already yeah. a New England IPA. I think we filter so, it more. So Jeff, you're right. close to civil society, right? Yeah, yeah. So kind of like something like that, to where it's like this big citrusy, like crazy exactly. hot bomb. Kind of, that and honestly, man, I I only I was only down there one time, but I I loved what they were doing. Their beers are really really good. The Florida oh, IPAs, yeah. New England are kind of brother and sister. From my knowledge, I think New England uses more not necessarily citrus, but more other fruits compared to the Florida IPAs are primarily oranges. That yeah, the New England IPAs are fruit bombs, but they're a lot of citrus, but they're really fruity and very floral. Uh, yeah, so Red Cypress is a great fruit. Right, and then the Florida IPAs are like it's, straight up citrus and orange. Right. Like, but I also, the big thing now is is this Florida Berliner Weiss that everybody's doing these Florida style Berliner Weisses and I'm calling them a Florida, a Florida Weiss. Right. Mm -hmm. Which is like great. If you, I have to live in the state that picks my least favorite style as their favorite style. Uh, so, <laughs> so why, why so against Berliners, man? No, it's not that I'm against. I just them. To... Like I said, I, I don't have Thank any geez. gaps, and I don't have any gaps in my uh, palate anymore. I, so, so my progression was super weird. All right. Okay. Because, like you said, so everybody starts either super hoppy or super malty, like one polar opposite of the other. Mm -hmm. I, I hated hops. Then I loved malts. Then I loved, like, I went straight to imperial stouts and, like, Baltic porters and, like, just the biggest, baddest things that you could drink on the malt side. Higher ABV, yeah. the better. Then I jumped into double IPAs. So I went back and forth from hops and malts, and those were my two favorite styles of beer, were double IPAs and imperial stouts. I hated Belgians. I hated sours. And then... Up until very recently, probably the last eight months or so, Darren at Wob, and you, I asked him because Darren loves sours. I was like, Darren, you have to like work with me on getting my palate adjusted to sours. And once I started getting into sours, I realized how amazing they are because I really do love sours all across the board. I'm, granted, I'm much more. I'm much more prone to get an American wild or a Goza than I am to get like a Flemish red or something like, you know what I mean? Like bigger and bolder and vinegary, but I love, I love all the sours except Berliner Weisses. And the reason is because I always think of fucking cheese every time. No, and I can tell you why, and it man. It psychs you me out. It psychs me Dude, out. 
no, 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 no. You've had one or two bad versions. Don't let that ruin you on everything else. Because if you if you treat lactobacillus improperly, and I'm sorry, I don't mean to like just jump in and take this grandstand on it, but please do, uh, no, dude, do what you want. It's okay, <laughs> dude. It's 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 one of those things that grinds my gears on it. Like I love Berliner vices, and I know exactly what you're talking about. If you treat lactobacillus wrong, you can get like cheesy feet. You can get like bile. You can get baby diaper, like all these random different things that are disgusting to where your brain actually baby, compute. Baby diaper. A, yeah. Baby diaper. It's just, yeah. <laughs> so it's just a nice way of saying shit. Yeah. It, saying it tastes like shit. You would think that it would be specifically <laughs> shit, but it's weirdly baby diaper. Um, <laughs> okay. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. Uh, band but it's one of those things where like, band-aid. yeah, bandit, like crazy finale. Yeah. 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 So mm-hmm. it, it's one of these like, Brewers kind of experimenting with lacto or experimenting with souring agents where they don't actually do the research, almost talking about what we were talking about earlier, where like it may be that flooding of the of the market, um, but they're just not putting out good products. And because of that one bad representation, you don't like that style now. But when it's done yeah. cleanly, it's it's super clean. It's super tart, super citrus. Like it's it's amazing. So what it is and what sucks about it is I think there is a small percentage like a very small point of of all of those flavors in that style. Like, there's not. It's that. like, there's not. Well, gotta, in I every have. single Berliner Weiss I've ever had, I can pick up on it because I'm very sensitive to it. Now that I have had, and I'll admit, it was like I probably had one really bad one. Like I was probably like, wow, this is Cheez Its with raspberry no. jam on top. Absolutely, and there, like, there's a lot of bad versions out there, man. And, and I, I know that I've had that, that really bad one that really just ruined it for me. But because of it, I'm like so sensitive to that off flavor that like I taste it in every one of them. And, and I hate that because it's a style that is, like you've said, susceptible to having those off flavors. But I, it, to some degree, this is why everybody says like the master Cicerones like are, are just plagued. They don't even like drinking beer anymore because they taste an off flavor in every beer. Mm-hmm. Like, to some degree, there's there are off flavors in almost every beer that you open. There's never you're the, the odds of you opening up a perfect beer that has not had a single of the many many things that can make your beer taste a little different than it's supposed to yep. in it is is impossible. But you if you're not sensitive to the off flavors, then you don't even notice them because they're so minute. But well, even me, then, like with that, they're in there, but it depends on what parts per million they're in or what threshold they're in, and all that kind of stuff. So I totally agree with you. They're definitely in there. But right. So yeah. for me, I'm just overly sensitive to it. Where if I taste it for even the tiniest bit, I'm like, oh, uh, nope, cheese. It's cheese. But I've gotten better at it. And I've I've learned to kind of forget about that. And I'm and I've also I've also learned that one of the biggest triggers for me on that, like getting that cheesy taste is if there's raspberry in that style. I do not do okay. raspberry Berliner Weisses. I can do any other style of Berliner Weiss, and I'm okay. Just a regular Berliner Weiss, totally cool. But raspberry, for whatever reason, just brings out that that bad, that off flavor to me. See, I would wonder why that is, you know what I mean? Like, as far as, you know, maybe the raspberries being at a certain point where the lactobacillus is, you know, engaging with certain components of it or whatever it may be, so. Yeah, it's just, I don't know, it's weird, but it's it's ra- it's specifically raspberry Berliner Weisses now. Which sucks because that's like the most popular kind of Berliner advice that you can find. Yep. So I kind of <laughs> want to circle back to <clears throat> before we wrap up the show and get kind of final thoughts on the topic. Uh, Jeff, you mentioned that um, Orlando's bar scene is pretty, pretty good, pretty, pretty uh, broad, substantial. Yeah, substantial, right? And and Chris, I, you know, I kind of want your opinion on what I'm about to ask. <clears throat> ask to um, how come it with such a a bar scene or a nightlife scene so great as Orlando, how come these bars don't carry more local beers? So <clears throat> Red Cypress is in distro. Hourglass kind of sort of in distro. And then Central 28 kind of sort of as well. And we're talking not, not East Coast, not Daytona, just kind of Seminole, Orange County, maybe Lake County. But how come more – you know, locations like these Frankensteins and, and WAVs don't carry more local stuff. Jeff, you want to take that? Yeah. Um, for, uh, for WAV, I know one, I mean, let's see. 
I think they carry a lot of local stuff. The thing is that you're, you're going to have your mandated taps. You're going to have your taps that, that are stylistically set on whatever they are. And then the other thing that you have to think about is that you have a finite amount of taps and there's an infinite amount of breweries. So like local could be anything. Everybody gets into lo- you know, into distro and they automatically assume I'm going to get into world of beer. I'm going to get here. I'm going to get there. Um, I think I, I, you know, I've never gone to any of those places in Orlando where they don't have a good local, you know, scene, at least, at, at least 20, you know, 15, 20% of their taps are usually local breweries. The thing is that I, they're always rotational locals. Nobody has like, a, you know, I always have on red Cypress. That's, you know, that's hard to get. And it kind of circles back to what I said with permanent distribution. It's just not an easy thing to do because there's so many options. Um, but, you know, the other thing could be that the, as we've talked about the stigma around local beer in Orlando is that it's not very good. So, you know, we could know it's good. Like we could put death roll on. We've all said death roll is a freaking fantastic stout. Um, and, and we could put that on and somebody who says, Oh, you know, my buddy said red Cypress sucks. All of a sudden they're not going to want to buy death roll. Um, the good news is that most people agree that death roll is awesome. So they do sell it very well. Um, but it's not a beer that you put on permanent distribution either. So it's just, it's a, it's a hard game to get local distribution in any kind of permanent sense, especially when we have two, you know, Goliaths in Florida that are technically local with, with cigar city and funky Buddha. And I think majority of your, your smaller bar operations that want to have a local presence are going to default to those two before they do anybody else. Um, just because you know, they're always going to be available and you know that the second you put that tap on, everybody's going to recognize it and they're going to buy it. So that also, you know, it's a competitive market for local. I agree that's, with all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Chris. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's 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 a lot of factors, man. I think it's pretty brewery specific as far as you know why some do well and some don't. Um, and you can kind of break it down to a couple different areas where, you know, the brand itself, uh, obviously having quality product that has to ring true, but the marketing, like the branding itself, Funky Buddha does a great job of that. To where you know you see that 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 Funky Buddha insignia and you know it, you know that you see that tap handle, you know it's Funky Buddha. Right. Some of the other brands out there don't do it that well. Um, you know, once, once the beer leaves the actual brewery too, it's going to the distributors and, and I will never say anything bad about any distributor out there. Um, cause obviously they, they do a great job for, for getting the product out there and, and really helping to build a lot of these businesses. But at the same time, you know, they've got certain things that they've got to push at the end of the day, they they, they need their numbers to grow. Um, whether it's your brand or, or somebody else's brand, they're, they're going to make their numbers grow. So where do you fall in that, that line of, or that, that totem pole? of like priority with them trying to grow certain brands like uh, would you have you, would you say that you've seen that before jeff i'm sorry what was the question like like basically like <laughs> <laughs> i was checking my <laughs> fantasy team i promise i yeah. didn't mean to <laughs> no dude no worries uh so like basically we we're talking about like a like say once the beer leaves the actual brewery and goes to the distributor at that point it's up to the distributor like you know where do they oh, yeah. where does that brand fall in between you know certain other brands that may be in that same house and oh. God, you so, have no idea. That's uh, the distributor. The distributor. Uh, maybe you don't want to say it. I'll say it. I've been in the distributor side before, and I've been on the. Uh, I've been on the uh, consumer side, um, or the account. Uh, distributors have more power than they should ever have over where a brand ends up and how much a brand is pushed. And and it's it's kind of sad. I've seen them take some really good brands, some really good breweries some really good, you know, I I was in the liquor uh, side of distribution and I've seen them take brands and just kick them on the back burner and forget about them. Distributors sign brands just to kill them, to get competition away from another one of their brands. Um, You know, they have a little bit weight, you know, a little bit too much power over where a brand ends up and really how much they want to put that brand on display. And um, I think, I think originally Funky Buddha kind of fell into that role of like, we're the answer to Cigar City. Like, and I think that that's why distributors went ham on them. 
like they were like, this is the answer. Like we can, can finally compete with Cigar City. And then they all ended up under the same house anyway. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. but, but it's, uh, you know, distributors can definitely kill a brand and they can put a brand as high as they want to on their priority list. Um, and, and, you know, we know now in Orlando, Brown has every, every Florida brewery that there is for the most part, there's, you know, 95% of the distributor is Brown. Well, actually Brown no longer exists. So. Oh, right, 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 yeah, uh, yeah, FTC, yeah. FTC. But Jeff do that, Jeff do that. <laughs> No, no, no worries. But at the same time, like on that on that same account, like yeah, they they do have a lot of power, and and that's kind of what I was talking about is where do, where do you fall within that power hierarchy? You know what I mean? Do you, you know, the the brands that do well are the ones that work well with that distributor, um, right. or you know they they work well to where both of the interests are aligned, um, and then some of them just they they just don't see eye to eye, and maybe it just doesn't work out. It is what it is. But also at the same time, like you look at some of these local brands, like you were mentioning, like a lot of the local breweries that are starting up in distribution. You know, why aren't you seeing them everywhere? You know, sometimes when they're going in, they've they've got other aspects that they need to fill. They need to build some numbers on brand X or brand Y. And so when they go in, they could pitch you, but now they know they need to build X and Y that month. So there's that. You know what I mean? And there um, might not even be support for that brewery either, you know? And there, yeah. there might not – you don't know what incentives distributor, you know, distributors have and who's paying – not who's paying them. It's not, it's not like some illegal wild, wild west operation, but like the breweries that have financial backing can pay to get their, their brand out there more. Absolutely. And incentive on it. And they'll say, whichever sales rep sells this much gets this much. And what, it, and you know what, or, or, Hey, you guys sell, whoever sells the most funky Buddha gets to, you know, a, a week vacation down in Fort Lauderdale. We'll pay for your hotel. You're on the beach mm-hmm. and we'll take you to funky Buddha, you know? And in that that kind of stuff, like shit, you told me that I would sell a billion cases of Funky Buddha. Because why not? You get a week paid exactly, vacation, man. you get to go down there and have a good time. Like, and they have the money to do it. So there's a lot of reasons that the Goliaths stay the Goliaths, and the small guys get kind of kicked to the back burner. Yep. And so, so like, even then, like, it's, say it's doing well in the in the distributor side, the distributors are pushing it well, then then you have to worry about the account as well. Like, so they sell it into, you know. Bobo's bar or whatever, you know, or is it on the menu? Is, is, are they training the staff? Um, are they relying on the fact that they're, they're invested in selling that certain product or is it just something that, Oh, a local beer school. Yeah. Just uh, order that case. It'll sell itself. And then they'll wonder why it's not moving. You know what I mean? Yeah. Right. So, yeah, that's a huge thing. It's making sure the staff understands what it is, especially in beer understands what it is, what it tastes like, flavor profile, uh, ABV, what the story behind it, where it comes from, because that's what people want to know. You know, yep. if you say, Hey, I got local beer, it's from Gainesville. It's like, cool. If you go, <laughs> man, I got this awesome, I got this awesome beer. It's, you know, so, and so here's the story behind it. The brewer had this, you know, he woke even the stupid fucking, what's the stupid story? Uh, the banana, the, the heffin awesome. What was the story behind that? Uh, he woke uh, up and he woke up made breakfast and uh he had a peanut butter sandwich but no jelly and he saw a banana on the counter and uh combine them mm-hmm. yeah that story right there is like if you tell a person that even though it's like a it's a stupid it's like an easy story you tell a person that and that beer is going to sell 100 yeah, percent. If, yeah. if i told a customer that they'd be like that's funny okay i'll buy that beer yeah. i want to try it now i'm intrigued but if you don't, and if you, the staff doesn't know, and the, there's no rep in the field, or there's no, you know, distributor pushing that brand and telling them those stories, then it just becomes another shelf turd that sits there, and nobody knows about it. And it could be great beer, but nobody even knows about it. Mm-hmm. You so, know. So to answer your previous question, like there's, I don't, I don't think that it's because Orlando has a bad beer scene that it, like it's just not, or even Florida in general that it's not working out. I think there's just a lot of other variables that can really, you know, come up against certain brands. So. So I'm kind of glad that you guys kind of, we kind of, we get to circle back for once and not just go on drunk tangents. So kind of in wrapping up to the original question as, you know, as we're kind of wrapping the show up. So is the oversaturation of mediocre or subpar beers drowning craft beer, the industry with all everything we've talked about, everything we've kind of gathered with distroing, with reputation and image and quality and impressions and whatnot. Are the newer breweries that aren't really getting it right yet drowning the rest of the, of the rest of the industry? 
Well, what do you think? Yeah. What do I think? I yeah. think they are <clears throat> because okay. uh, just, I mean, just like we've mentioned, you know, I go in and I go into brewery A and I get something that I think would be easy, like their wheat beer. I try it. It's like, oh man, this isn't really good. And I really, there's so many other options out there to, for me to go back takes a lot when I can go to Red Cypress, I can go to Broken Cauldron, I can go to Bowiegans and know that, have that expectation of going there, drinking that wheat, drinking that IPA, drinking that whatever, and be satisfied. So yeah, it, I think I think it is drowning because it's like, all right, well, can't go to that brewery anymore now too. And can't go to Sanford because, you know, that brewery is not doing very well. Can't go to Winter Park or, or you know, Tampa or whatever the case is. So, I, you know, it's it's really causing, I think, a divide of, you know, upper and lower class in terms of you got the Giants, you got the kind of like the local stuff that isn't really that good, but what's enticing you to go to these local breweries when you know the Giants, you can get their bottles kind of at the bar or at, at a liquor store or whatever the case is. So, yeah, I think they're drowning. I think, you know, the whole process of opening a brewery, opening that whole thing, you need to get your recipes down. You need to get, even if you're copying a style that's already big, like a New England IPA, Florida IPA, cocoa nibs and, and coconut, do it. Because even if it's something that everyone else is doing, as long as it's good like everyone else is, you'll still stick out because you have that local factor to where that local factor only goes so far if you're putting out subpar stuff. That makes sense. You can see Damn. that. So yeah. It's, it's, I said I no, but it's, I don't know it's, now. It's not imploding as a, a crisis, but it's making people who enjoy craft beer more selective. And because they're being more selective, it's causing a slight ripple in terms of not only rumors, but conversations and whatnot about what's good. Hey, I'm coming to Orlando. What are good breweries? Mm -hmm. Hey, I can tell you. First one is I can tell you which ones to avoid. And then you can kind of choose right. between the other. Here's the bad ones. And then here's the Don't other. go here. But Don't go, go but here. Go. But all these other places, you'll be fine. And that's, I mean, that's what I recommend people. That's how I see other people recommend is, you know, hey, I'm coming to Orlando. What do you suggest? Don't go here. These other places are okay or, or the girdle, you know, whatever. So it's, it's nothing to panic about. But it's, I think it's definitely thinning out or quote unquote watering down the industry at least locally in, in florida for me see i don't i don't know if i'd agree with the whole watering down thing um i think that we're just seeing how the craft beer industry has been throughout the last couple decades coming to our front door you know what i mean sure. we've just never really seen a lot of local breweries around us we've never had to see certain ones be successful we've never had to see certain ones not do well um we've seen that throughout the state as far as how we've kind of you know, looked over, say, Cigar City and Funky Buddha, they're doing awesome, and some other ones that we won't mention that may not be doing as well. Right. Um, I, I really don't think it's that big of a problem. And the reason I say that is it may be kind of uh, dumb to do this, but I kind of have this faith in, in the consumer now to where I feel like they're becoming more educated. Um, I feel like they're, it's going to be a little bit more self-policing in the sense to where, you know, the, the breweries that aren't doing well um, won't actually get the business. The ones that are doing well, we'll get that feedback. We'll 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 have the you know the talk of the town kind of thing um, through the beer community. Now we may see some of those those brands that aren't doing well to where they get those first uh, first time craft people coming in and they're trying out the brews. They're they're trying to decide whether craft beers for them or not. Um, but I don't know about you guys. I've you know when I started drinking beer uh, or going to craft breweries, you know there there were some that nowadays you know I, I wouldn't go back to them. But at the time, I would still go back. I knew it wasn't that great of a product, but I, I still really enjoyed, you know, what it was, craft beer, the community, uh, you know, talking to the people right. that oh, actually yeah. made it. I'm all about the atmosphere. Yeah. So, I mean, like, they still had that component to it. So that's kind of what drew me into it. Um, so whether the beer is great or not, you're still going to look for that. And then once you find places that have a, maybe a better product, um, you, you may start kind of gravitating towards those brands. So I, I'd kind of have a little bit more faith in the in the consumer to kind of police itself to kind of maybe perpetuate the brands that are doing well. Um, I, I really don't think it's you know an impending issue. Um, and I, I I'm agree. Kind of, yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. I'm I'm kind of excited to see like I, we're we're I think we're in a very very weird like precipice to where 
things are changing. We, we are no longer this, this central Florida community that doesn't have a lot of breweries that, you know, just was kind of this wasteland that we just made do with what we had. It's now, you know, we've got a lot of budding breweries to where I personally am kind of excited to see what they do and which ones actually succeed. And I'm, I'm hoping they all will. Um, but maybe some may not, and it is what it is. That's just business at the end of the day. But, um, there, there are a lot of them that I'm kind of, I'm kind of excited to say that they're from Orlando and kind of tell people about them throughout the state. So. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's definitely, it's, it's growing and it's definitely, I'm not, I'm not overly offended by what Orlando has to offer anymore as far as a craft beer or just going out scene. So it, it came to be uh, right when I was leaving is when I thought it started to kind of pick up, which is good because now I'm gone. Um, <laughs> but uh, what I, I guess I went, I literally with both of your closing arguments, I'd be a terrible juror. Because like both of your closing arguments, I was like, I agree with them, and they were well, completely we're, opposed. We're both saying kind of the same thing. <laughs> so, no, they yeah, were. I opposed. think it's just perspective on the same yeah. argument. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, just the same. Well, okay. same thing, different words. What I say, what I think is that I do not think it's an impending issue. I think it is indicative of what people have been saying for the last year, year and a half, of this craft beer bubble and when we're, when are we going to hit it and what's going to happen when we do. And I think that in the next couple of years, you will see breweries closing. And I think the reason will be exactly like Chris said, that the self policing is going to happen. The consumer is more educated the consumer. They're going to say, I'm not going to that brewery because their beers suck and they don't do their job. They don't do what they're supposed to do. Right. And what ends up happening is breweries are going to start closing their doors. And as bad as it is for those breweries, I don't necessarily find an issue with the industry. I think that that will be a self-regulation of a booming industry coming to earth. And this is where it should settle. Now, will it continue to grow? Yes. But at, a, at an actual sustainable rate, I think it will. You know, after this bubble bursts and we settle where we're supposed to. Um, the reason that I think that we're kind of doing that is because it's the only business, especially in hospitality, that I think people are opening before their opening day ready, and it's okay. Like, it's acceptable to open before you're ready to open. And I, I hate that. I think that that's bullshit. I'm in the exact that, same boat, man. Yep. I think you I should be held accountable to that. Um, I, I agree that if you're putting out good product from the first few months and you're going to build on it, great. If you can put out stylistically, you know, accurate products from the beginning and then build into whatever you're going to build into, I'm not saying you open your doors as Cigar City. I'm saying open your doors as whatever you are, but be opening day ready. Know how your, your equipment works. Know your recipes are solid. Don't be testing your recipes at the expense of your consumer. Don't be mm. testing your recipes at the expense of your brand. Good point. And and, and don't be opening before your opening day ready. It blows my mind that I go into these places and I've, op I have gone into, and, and not just one, but two different breweries that I won't name where I've gone in and they don't even really have their tap room set up. They're open, but they don't even have like all their furniture and they just kind of have chairs strewn about and they kind of have, you know, they have 20 taps, but seven of them are tapped and they don't even have the rest of them on. And you're like, what the hell? Like, what is this? Like, don't you're opening your business this way. And, and I know craft beer, so I would go back and give you a second chance. But if I didn't, and I was just some bar guy who wanted to try this new place and I went in and saw what it was, I'd be like, I'm never going back to that weird fucking place. Right. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And like, that's, I think there's such a weird disconnect where like, I don't think a lot of uh, breweries, this is, the, I'm blanket state, statementing when I shouldn't. There are certain breweries that I don't think have the business intellect to understand the business side of what they're doing. And so they're pumped about the beer. I want to get going. I want to get selling. I want to get open. And they open before they're ready. And they don't know about the, you know, you should have enough money to run for one year with zero profits. You should be opening day ready when you open the doors. Like, basic shit, you know, like the basic rules of business. Um, you can put out a great product all you want, but if your staff's not trained properly and they're not selling it properly or you don't even have uniforms or, you know what I mean? Like 
some of the shit that you see are just kind of like, you weren't ready to open. Why'd you open? I heard a really good saying uh, probably about two weeks ago where um, somebody actually equated to opening a brewery nowadays the same as like opening a restaurant to where with breweries maybe five years ago, you could open a brewery and everyone wanted to see that brewery succeed. So they would drink the the bad beer. They would deal with the bad branding. They would, you know, deal with whatever bad tap room hours that were happening because they wanted like it was a cool. It was a brewery. It's right on the corner. That's awesome. Right. Mm-hmm. But if a restaurant opens today, it doesn't have to succeed because it's a restaurant. Like you hold right. it to us. Yeah. You hold it to a certain um, like a certain ethos and a certain set of principles to where like you expect them to hit A, B and C and do it well for you to go back. That's kind of the same way that we're getting with breweries nowadays. You know what Absolutely. I mean? Yeah. Well, and the thing is, with that that same line of thinking, like I'm in restaurants. I've been in restaurants pretty much my entire life. Restaurants, when they open, you try them once, maybe twice, and you're exactly. done with that. That's yep. it. You do, if, you, if you try them once and you have a bad experience, you maybe, maybe go back a second time to get them a second chance. The second time and, is like a service to the company. Like that's, and, that's bold. If they, if they do not come through even better than your expectations on that second time, you're not going back to that place. And not only that, you're also telling every one of your friends that I tried that new restaurant and it wasn't very good. Mm-hmm. So the, the worst thing you can do nowadays is not open ready to impress your first customer. Because the second you impress that first customer, the word of mouth is that's your, you get 80% of your free advertisement in that first month. Yep. Like every person who visits that tap room is going to talk about it because you're new. And the second the next new place opens, you're already fucked for your free advertisement. Mm-hmm. So if you don't impress those people in that first month, they're not coming back. Right. And that's what it boils down to. I mean, Mike, how many times have we talked about it? And I, I will name them by name just because we've done it a billion times. How many times have we talked about 1010 and how we should, we oh, have yeah, to go buzzer. back. Yeah. We have to go back because we, you know, we had their beers weren't good when they first opened and we have to go back and retry them. Have you gone back? No. <laughs> I haven't either. I no, haven't either. <laughs> well, until, until two months cool. ago, I was living five minutes down the road and I never went back because they did not impress me in their first month of being open. Sure. Right. And that's that's what I'm saying is and is that unfair on my side? Probably. But that's how you hold them accountable now. Is right. you need to open ready to do business. Yep. So we're gonna we're gonna wrap it up there. I'm not keeping track of time, but I know we're definitely over, over. the hour mark. Yeah. So uh Sorry, man. If, no dude, no. It's always good to have good stuff than a lot of bad stuff. Anyway, so Jeff, any anything coming up with you on your end? Any trips or events or no nah, man i've been i've been busy 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 personal life wise i am going up to oh what am i talking about no trips i'm an idiot i'm going to Asheville next week well duh the way you think I mentioned that. <laughs> i'm going to Asheville next week you're probably like why is he not talking about Asheville? <laughs> you're right that's what i'm like <laughs> yeah. trips trips yes i'm going to Asheville next week i'm going to a wedding up in the mountains in north carolina and then i'm spending three days in Asheville afterwards um we're going to do some breweries. We're going to see pretty much everything Asheville has to offer, doing a little zip lining through the mountains, doing all kinds of fun stuff. Uh, the place I'm staying is actually an Airbnb, and it is nice. literally lit- literally across the street from uh, – from uh, what's it fucking called? Why am I drawing a blank right now? Oscar Blues. No, no. <laughs> Wicked no, Weed. No, what? Wicked Weed. Thank you very much, Chris, for not – Yeah. Me. It's across the street from Wicked Weed. And I'm, awesome. I'm right there. So, and I was all pumped about it and ready to tell you guys. And then I forgot the name of the brewery like an idiot, <laughs> but, uh, yes, uh, that'll be a cool trip. I, um, I expect a full report. Uh, you'll probably, I'll probably be bringing, <laughs> I'll probably be swinging back through. Well, I definitely am swinging back through Orlando on the way back home and I might leave some beers with Cassie for you. So cool. By might, well, I mean, I I'm definitely leaving you. Some but I still got you the Bow Egan's too. That's a side note, though. Oh, you got me that. Yeah. Sick. No, no, no. I got you the uh, the the strawberry shortcake one. Oh, okay, cool. I get you the Belgian because I don't think you like Belgians. But I was wrong. Chris, you want anything? You want anything from Wicked Weed, man? I mean, I won't turn anything down. I won't be <laughs> okay. Angry, but also, at the same time, something shows up. I love your face. <laughs> <laughs> so I might Jeff, be leaving some bottles with like. 
cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah you'll I'll... get a full report. And it was uh, it was nice shaking the rust off. I know we were a little slow to start this episode, so I'm glad that we got it uh, out of our system here. I think the yeah. second half ran really smooth. Absolutely, cool. Ben. Cool. Excited uh, Chris, to have you on, Chris. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, uh, Thank you, Ben. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm uh, done uh, now. Uh, right. Okay. Okay, you're done. All right, Chris. Anything coming up with you? Events, trips, news. Yeah, man. Um, outside of professional life, um, I don't know if you guys have heard of the little bar called the Thirsty Topher. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. We've been doing been. some some. No, really? No. Get one of these days. It. I gotta go. So we've been doing some brew days over there, and, and basically what we're doing is uh, brewing up some beer and then kind of donating it out and putting the proceeds to charity. So uh, we'll be tapping a beer on the 18th, um, which is a Tuesday, which is a New England style IPA. Um, outside of that, I actually just uh, landed some uh, Florida hops. I don't know if you guys have heard about the Florida hops consortium. Yep, we've we've heard of it. Yeah. Yeah, man. So I, I got my hands on some uh, some hops from them. So we'll be brewing up a batch with those as well. Um, kind of donating the proceeds of that keg. Um, that's pretty much it, man. Everything else is all just festivals with, with a professional life. So take it. Well, yeah. I don't know if I mentioned it on, on air or not, but uh, <clears throat> I'll say anyway, I got a new job, so I am no longer working weekends, which means weekends all turning into beer fest and yeah debauchery and trips to jupiter to visit jeff yeah <laughs> dude yes well i mean jupiter we can do we can do Tequesta. we can do civil yeah. society we can go down to funky Buddha, do south yeah. freaking salt water oh we got all kinds of stuff man yeah, sailfish so <laughs> my, my schedule's gotten a lot better uh next weekend is kind of where it's in full effect so i'll be able to do episodes kind of anywhere in the state gainesville to thirsty topher down south wherever but uh, I'll be at Windermere with Matt from Mosquito County, uh, pouring some beers there, hanging out, doing whatever. Uh, so pretty much any kind of beer fest in or around Orlando, I will be attending or at least trying to attend. So uh, we'll, you know, better future content. You know, um, Absolutely, man. Other than that, just enjoying my Monday through Friday, full-time gig post-college. A uh, long time coming, but it's, it's been a lot of fun. You're so uh, grown up. I know, right? It's about time. <laughs> You're so grown up and your voice is still cracking. Yeah, I know. Yeah, sore throat. Got from Chicago on my business trip. On a business trip. <laughs> on a business trip. But yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, I want to apologize for everyone who's been waiting for a while on an, on an episode. I know I've been hounded and a lot of shit going on with not only my schedule, but, you know, Jeff's schedule and him getting situated and, you know, finding a third host and getting Chris and then kind of a whole bunch of shit at once but uh yeah i'm i'm glad to be back hopefully next time you hear me i won't sound like a a 13 year old kid it's great Um, to be back i'm really excited to be back yeah i miss doing the episodes guys for real so happy to be back sorry it took so long i was getting settled in i had to i had a whole relocation slash new job everything going on so i'm i'm happy to be back and talking to y'all yeah so definitely expect episodes weekly if not pretty almost fucking weekly i know next week's already a problem because jeff's out of town <laughs> i'll do it i'll do it but no, i'll we'll, still we'll, do it we'll figure something out we'll we'll, we'll get it cassie we'll get will it be on it too cool so um yeah so uh episodes i think will be uploading every wednesday or thursday but um from here on out Sweet. But, uh, just want to thank everyone for joining me on a football sunday and thanks everyone for listening uh and watching on youtube and until next guy until next time see you at the bar hello Woo.